Paul Harding. Paul is the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning Tinkers and a follow-up, Inan. He is director of the MFA in Creative Writing and Literature at Stony Brook University and lives on Long Island, New York. Paul, welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be back. So your new novel is called This Other Eden. Sugi and I have just been arguing about the possibility of Edens or Paradise's earthly type. Anyway, she says no. I say maybe. Um, could you talk about and describe the other Eden in your book? Where is it? When did you first begin learning about it or imagining it? Sure. Um, yeah, it was um, one of those straight kind of happy accidents, as it were. I, I was casting around for a, a story for another novel, you know, just trying to figure as one does. Yeah, exactly. You know, and there's just a lot of that, that early, you know, just trying to invoke something. And I actually started writing about um, a minor character from my second book, Enon, uh, an 80 or 90 year old woman named Mrs. Hale, who has a big estate on, uh, you know, in, in the, the, the town Enon. And um, I just thought, well, you know, what I'll do is I, I want to go back and I want to write about, I'll write about her when she's like 10 years old. Uh, and I knew it wouldn't be the story, but I just, you know, had to have something to go on. So what I did was, um, I just had this weird scene of like her and her mother and her aunts and stuff, and they're sort of having tea or a picnic in the big fam the meadow on the family's property. Um, and as I do with all my novels, I um, everything I'm reading, all the paintings, all the music I'm listening to, everything somehow or another get thrown into the manuscript at, at the earliest stages. Um, as I was reading, I'm a sucker for uh, still life and landscape paintings, and I came across a uh, 19th century American painter named Charles Ethan Porter, a uh, black guy, and, um, and he had beautiful still life and beautiful landscape, and I came upon a wonderful painting of his of a meadow that had just been mowed, and they had just done the hay. Um, and so I just literally through the background of the scene with Mrs. Hale as a child. Uh, just, just some guy out there painting, you know, there's some guy out there with an easel and everybody's sort of wondering who he is, you know. And then at the time I was also uh, reading, <laughs> oddly enough, um, a history of organized labor in the United States after the Civil War. Um, and one of the things that's fascinating about unions is that they were one of the first institutions to um, advocate for civil rights, for women's suffrage, you know, that sort of thing. And um, it just occurred to me that there must have been all Black um, uh, towns or settlements um, or racially integrated settlements or communities uh, throughout the country, uh, you know, after, after the Civil War. So I just Googled, you know, a couple of key words. And I started finding, oh, lo and behold, there are any number of these communities throughout, you know, throughout the country. And I uh, eventually came upon the story of a place called Malaga Island, which is um, off the coast of Maine, southern coast of Maine, which from about 1792 or 1793 until 1912 was the, um, the site of a racially integrated um, community that was started by um, uh, a black man who was uh, uh, had been formerly enslaved. They didn't know, they didn't know whether he escaped or whether he was he was freed. Um, and his uh, wife was a woman from uh, Galway, Ireland. And uh, so I was intrigued, and I was you know having written about Maine before in my book Tinkers. I thought, oh, that's interesting, Maine. Um, and then it turns out. Um, that um, I discovered that some of the people, so the people were evicted by the state of Maine in 1912, summer of 1912. And in reading about it, I discovered that a number of those people were um, were uh, committed to a place called the Maine School for the Feeble-Minded. And that was one of the institutions also that in my earlier book, Tinkers, a character was, was going to be committed to a place that was similar to that. So I thought, oh, you know, the, the novelist, you say, you know, give me a sign, give me a sign. Um, <laughs> and then the, the thing that sealed the deal for me was um, in my reading, uh, you know, about, you know, reading about eugenics and about all this sort of stuff, you know, that, that sort of came up with the couple of articles I read about the island. I discovered that almost to the month, I think, the people were being evicted from the island. Um, the first International Congress for Eugenics was taking place. Um, in London, and I just felt like, 
that's it. That's the sign. You know, the dowsing rod started to switch. And so I just started to, um, I realized when I went back to my little, the germ of the novel, it was just one of those funny moments. I just looked at, you know, somebody mentioned, you know, in what I've been writing, who's that guy out in the field painting? And I realized that person somehow or another is was from Malaga Island. And then that then the mystery was I, I've got to I've got to figure out how he how he came to be in Enon, Massachusetts painting. That's an amazing story. I was sort of imagining that you had um and it's like, how is Paul gonna answer this question? Did he happen to end up on Malaga Island? And um, you know, you referenced um the formerly enslaved man and his wife from Galway. And and in the novel, this is Benjamin, these these people appear as Benjamin Honey and his wife Patience. Right. They arrive in, in 1793. And those are basically the first, the first lines of the novel. And I wonder if we could just go over the inhabitants of uh the fiction in, in the novel. This is fictional Apple Island. And I wonder if we could just go over who is there um real quick because the now of the story is is 1911 and and who's still there from the honey family what other families live there and who um who are esther and ethan honey so esther esther is um she's certainly one of the main one of if not the main characters in the book the book sort of moves protagonists around a little bit but she is so she's probably a great I think a great grandchild of um, Benjamin and Patience, the original, the original couple, um, and she's kind of the, the matriarch. Um, she has a son uh, named Eha, and he has three children. Um, and he, um, he, uh, um, 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 has two daughters and a son named uh, the son. His son's name is Ethan. And um, one of the things that was striking about the um, the articles that I read about about Malaga Island were the photographs. There were photographs from the island and of the of, of the folks who lived there. And one of the most striking photographs was uh, there's a school on the island, and it was a picture of all the kids that were at the school. And um, the children ranged in skin tone from you know from they, the people who presented as absolutely white to people who you know had more were absolutely black and just darker darker skin um and uh i just thought i thought that was fascinating and i and i've been you know was thinking of james weldon johnson's autobiography of an ex-colored man and that so then you know just just as you kind of again a riffing and kind of experimenting with the parameters and what you have on your hands i just thought you know, uh, if Ethan is this painter, um, maybe he presents as white. And um, so there's that family. And then there are a couple of other family, you know, the sort of the remnants, you know, sort of a few stray people from um, from uh, a formerly more robust um, community. So there are a couple of sisters. Um, uh, um, who who live together in the in like the cabin of an old schooner, and um, there's a, a a family of people who are quite inbred and they're sort of otherworldly. The children all kind of only come out at night, um, and um, they are the people that in the book end up being uh, sent to this school for the feeble-minded. Um, and then there's a guy named Zachary Hand to God Proverbs who was at, who's um, uh, Civil War veteran. He, he fought in the um, Connecticut, one of the uh, the black regiments in, um, from Connecticut in the Civil War, and he lives in a tree and he makes carvings of the old of scenes from the Old Testament. There's this, you know, it's the, the, the I think in reality there are like 47 people on the island, um, but I just scaled it down to concentrate on a smaller cast of characters. And then there's this um, uh, 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 white. Um, school teacher slash sort of missionary named Matthew Diamond, who has come to the island um, with the best of intentions. And he uh, he's actually a very good teacher and he teaches the students and a number of the Ethan. Ethan Honey is uh, a very good at painting, but there's a, a girl who's really good at Latin and another girl is you know, great at algebra. But since Ethan presents as white, um, one of the things that Matthew Diamond decides to try to do is to quote unquote, save Ethan by having a wealthy friend of his sort of sponsor Ethan. And that is, that ends up being the, the, um, 
the, uh, the, uh, the the character who owns the estate in in, in Enon. Um, well, yeah, I want to talk about Diamond because he's you know he's a representative of mainlanders, right? As the people on the island call him, and you know you include a letter early on in the book where he writes to a friend where he says, "I feel repulsion in the presence of a living Negro," which is not the best start for him as a character. Yeah, yeah. and he seems well, he seems to have like pity and concern for the Islanders. He also seems unable to let go of the racial categories that he's been brought up with. Um, would you, is that correct? I mean, how would you talk about, you know, his sort of liminal role there in between the state and the people that he loves, but doesn't know how to categorize? Yeah, you know, so partly it's just a case of, you know, the best intentions being, you know, producing the Terrible. worst possible results. Yeah. And he, I mean, he was, I wanted to, I wanted to make him, uh, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, a mixture of, contra you know, better and worse impulses, you know, um, that this is one of the virtues you know, of one of the things I love doing as a writer is putting things that are opposite right next to each other and never telling the reader what to think, you know. So on the one hand, he says that terrible thing and he has this, pre this prejudice. But he's also the only person who's actually trying to help the Islanders. Um and so I just want to make it sort of irreducible that you can't like I didn't want to invite a thumbs up or thumbs down judgment of him. I want him to be kind of irreducible and com complicated that way. The other thing I, you know, taking many pages from Shakespeare, but one of the things that I'm always fascinated with in Shakespeare's plays is that for the most part, um, all the characters who misbehave know they're misbehaving. They know better. But yet they do not, you know, they, so I liked, I liked the idea of him being aware that this was a terrible aspect of his character that he, he laments and yet still experiences. And I actually got the idea from that from, um, you know, in my <laughs> spare time as a citizen, I'm kind of a theology nerd. Um, and I read many, many thousands of pages of this Swiss theologian named Karl Barth. Um, just wonderful kind of cosmology and metaphysics and literary, you know, kind of exegesis. Um, and, you know, I really, really love it. And he was one of the founding members of what was called the Confessing Church, which during World War II was one of the few institutions that openly um, uh, um, um, disobeyed Hitler and worked and helped to get um, Jews out of Germany. And, you know, so his creds were good with me, you know, really. And and after 20 years of reading him, the, I just happened to come across a book of correspondence of his in where in a letter he's talking about how happy he is that um, his son does not suffer the affliction that Karl Barth does, which is the visceral disgust, the, uh, his words were the visceral disgust that he feels when he's in the, he felt when he was in the presence of a living Jew. And, you know, that was just like, you know, so, so I, it's as a novelist, yeah. I'm like pure gold. I'm going to, I'm going to give that the version of that line to this character. And, you know, and well, just, so that line is a deep cut in your reading there. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so that, yeah, that's, that's, um, but that again, that's that's to me, that's pure gold in terms of character and dramatic tension. And because you can't, I don't think it's an easy answer, you know, for, for yeah. For that. Um, and so, um, and that's one of the things going back to Esther, you know, the Esther, the second he walks onto the island and she sees him, she knows like disaster is, you know, yeah. you know that, that, that he's going to bring ruin to the to their to their community. So when you're writing a character like that how how does it feel to you um well I, I i think as a writer you have to be able to write you know it'd be like you know, how did it feel to write Macbeth? you know like no for sure I, you know I, well actually Macbeth would have been kind of fun you know so, you know um i don't know it just it feels serious you know you have to write you have to be very careful you have, but i wanted it to be real you know i wanted there to be yeah. a kind of realism I didn't want to write, I, I didn't want to make him a villain, you know, I didn't want to ma make him into just like a one dimensional sort of like, and he's the bad guy. I wanted him to be a real character that people would have to actually kind of think about and be laid claim to. Um, and, and that's also why I gave him the awareness and the fact that he really, 
understands that that's a that's a terrible aspect of, of his own character so that just seems that you know uh, that the, the 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 perennial human predicament of knowing better but not acting you know right. like from all the way from like i shouldn't i know i shouldn't smoke cigarettes and here i i shouldn't eat that cake I, you know i shouldn't sure. leave my brother in the ditch I shouldn't be a giant and, asshole, but it's like, yeah, well, you have to asshole. advocate for your characters, even if they're doing the wrong thing. You I feel like you as a writer, when you're in their head, you're trying to marshal your forces to make as convincing an argument as you can to the reader for their humanity, despite the bad things that they're doing. It's kind of like a trick. Yeah. And it's, a, and, and it's, for me, it's, it's less explanatory than it is just descriptive. What is it like yeah. for him? What is it like for him to have this feeling and feel, feel conflicted um, and yet he, again, he's there, he's educating them, you know, um, and I, I, I wanted it to have some of the kind of complexity and ambivalence and ambiguity of like real life when people actually, you know, sort of For with sure. better and worse feelings towards one another, try to negotiate one another's humanity. Yeah, I think I'm just curious about this because um, you sort of mentioned, of course, that you want this to be, I don't know, maybe productively uncomfortable for the reader or maybe that's how I would think about it and so I've been sort of thinking about what productive discomfort for Sugi that's a kind of paradise being productively uncomfortable productively, yeah that's how her everyone in her utopia all, would be productively all, uncomfortable all, all of the, the squirming all, all of, of the squirming, squirming. Yeah. I don't want the reader to squirm I don't I don't like making <laughs> readers feel uncomfortable what I my hope is and it's you know the way that I treat it too which is like you know I was this this whole story laid claim to me because I was like, this is a quintessential, you know, it's a main story. It's a New England story. It's a United States story. It's a human story. You know, that's why I have all the stuff about, you know, Genesis and Eden and Exodus and all, you know, Old Testament, because it's just this displacement, you know, these, these sort of communities that just get, you know, just kind of just, you know, sort of swept off. Um, and, and so I, I wanted to be realistic and I wanted, again, I just wanted to, you know, respect the reader and give them something where they, they, when they look at that character, their participation with that person, that character is, um, it re resembles what it's like to encounter people like that in real life. You know, so speaking of uh, speaking of real historical figures, Darwin plays a role here, or at least Darwin's theories as they were perverted by later generations, including his own son. Uh, yeah. into the very non-scientific pseudo field of eugenics. Mm -hmm. Could you talk to us about how those theories threaten this community on Apple Island and then read to us from the book? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I, um, you know, the, the, the community um, sort of considers, the, the larger community on the mainland considers the settlement to be kind of a, a blight, you know, on their on their image and just on their community. Um, and so they, um, I have it so that they, and it, which is, echoes what really happened. You know, the, these ideas of, of blood and blood being pure or polluted. Um, and, you know, you get, you get these old, um, yeah, like you say, pseudo-scientific, but they were, I mean, race itself, we should remember once was a science, you know, it was, you know, that, that, that it was this it was ideology masking as you know trying to pass under the imprimatur of of, of objective empirical science um and so what one of the things that happens to the island is that the you know group of doctors and people come over and they kind of do the craniometry and all those dreadful kind of you know I'm thinking of like Stephen Jay Gould and the mismeasure of man he had that book about Lombroso and all this kind of phrenology and stuff like that um and that's what, you know, those are two of the poles that I, you know, the, the sort of the, the, as it were, you know, white characters always, you know, when they talk about that kind of thing, it's the idea of purity, pure white, right? As opposed to, you know, polluted or corrupted blood. And the way that the Islanders talk about it, you know, the worst thing that you can be is plain white, you know? Um, you know so the, the, the idea that, you know, this whiteness and, and, and the way that it's negotiated um, and the worst thing is to be plain white, you know, and anyways. Um, so, yeah, so what happens is, um, yes, this, this, this council comes and sort of subjects all the people on the island to these just violent, it's, you know, there's no other word for it, it's just violent, humiliating, 
um, uh, types of, uh, you know, uh, inspections and measurements and all this sort of stuff. Well, let's hear it. Read yeah, that part. Sure. sure. Um, so this one, the committee has arrived. Um, the committee began with Iris and Violet Proverbs and the Sock Alexis children. Um, Iris and Violet um, 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 uh, take care of three um, um, Penobscot um, children who are orphans. Uh, Violet was in the yard, uh, stirring a load of overalls and dresses in the scalding pot. Iris and Emily Sock Alexis stood back to back in the open scuttle of the pilot house. Iris scouring a dress over a washboard at one wash tub, Emily pummeling a pair of denim pants through the cold rinse water in the other. Scotty and Norma Sock Alexis struggled to spread a wet bed sheet over the split rail fence for drying. Violet saw the group first and called out to her sister. Iris shouted out to them, who, they, who were they, still scrubbing her the dress. We're from the governor's office and doctors. Doctors, huh? Iris stopped her washing and studied the group. I didn't know doctors traveled in gangs. She wiped her hands on her apron and told Emily to finish rinsing the pants, then finish with the dress. She climbed down into the pilot house and came out the front door. We need to see the other girl too. And them, one of the men said, nodding toward Norma and Scotty, who stood holding either end of the sopping sheet, staring at the intruders. The other men began looking around the yard, noting the layout, the amniotic stink of the boiling soap, the messy hopper bin full of white ash where the sisters drew the lie, the patched and worn clothes the children wore. Iris grabbed the laundry stick from Violet and brandished it at the men. You're not anyone we know, she said. Stay away from here. And you get. This is an official matter of the state, one of the counselors said. State my eye. Now, Iris, please, Matthew Diamond said, I don't like this any more than you do, but they are here on the state's authority, and there's nothing we can do to change that right now. One of the doctors had brought a pair of metal calipers from his medical kit, and without having asked, was fitting them on either side of Scotty's head, even as the boy still held one end of the wet sheet. Violet dashed over and batted the bizarre tool out of the doctor's hands. Scotty dropped the sheet and tears spilled from his eyes. Get that damned ice picker away from his head. Violet gathered Scotty close and cradled his head against her bosom. The doctor stooped and picked the calipers up and wiped them clean with the forearm of his coat. It's not an ice, it's a, it's a scientific instrument. It won't hurt. This is necessary, ma'am, please. Just necessary my teeth, Violet said. Go near him with that thing again and I'll... She fainted at the doctor as if to punch him. Matthew Diamond said, Violet, no, just, just stop and I'll help sort this out. I can write to the... Mr. Diamond, Violet said without taking her eyes off the alarmed doctor, you're a good man as far as it goes, but your letters ain't worth balls on a you. Pardon me, and I'm going to write a busted jaw on this cute flatlander's face. And she fainted another lunge at the doctor. Thank you. I think, um, you know, I for one am cheering for Violet when she <laughs> lunges. I know. You know I, I think I'll give her a good... Who's not like give him give him hell, Violet? Um, yeah, yeah. You know she says necessary in my teeth, and we're all on board. And and they're measuring head sizes because they believe that skull shape and the bumps on a skull are an indication of character. And you know you yeah. were talking before about phrenology and 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 mental abilities. And and phrenology is of course a totally bogus science. Yeah. Um. And so I'm curious. Here's a softball. Did any contemporary pseudo scientific theories influence your investigation into the pseudo sciences of the past? Not not so much not not so much contemporary i mean there is all of the q and on in the air and you know I don't ivermectin know. came to mind when you were uh oh yeah when I, was reading this scene. I was thinking about all the pseudoscience that had come along for ideological reasons to accompany the covid outbreak yeah that's yeah i mean absolutely and i think that that's that that's the thing you know the, the thing i found myself interested in is um Again, what what people attach the label science to, you know, and and how uh, you know we have this sort of I believe in science, you know, it's a, anybody's yard, you know, yard sign, and it's sort of like 
science is not a metaphysical phenomenon. You know, there are gestures or acts which are scientific. And so the idea of kind of this really just very, very crass kind of three card Monty that people play with dressing up just what is old fashioned racism and bigotry and hatred um, as as if um, as if they are, you know, authentic, um, um, inevitable truths about about humans. Um, and I think that that's something that 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 for all the scientific progress there is, there is still like you will always have people attempting to do that. Um, so that's what I'm always, you know, that, that I'm sort of fascinated by. And yeah, and I think the COVID, all that sort of the anti-vaxxers and that sort of stuff, that was fascinating to me too, because, you know, I, for example, when you'd hear the black community does, you know, this, it, it, swaths of the black community that do that, that don't trust vaccine, vaccines, you, know, you just think of, you know. Um, um, but that uh, comes from, from scenes like the one you read, where you had a exactly. long history of a population that's been treated poorly by the medical community, very different from the people at, where was that big biker rally that was like in the middle of COVID that- uh, Sturgis. Wherever, at Sturgis, very different than the people at Sturgis who don't have- a, That was right near me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, those things are, um, yeah, I don't, you know, they're, they're just they're just fascinating because when you look into the history of science too, science is very, you know, like um, facial recognition. Right. Or artificial intelligence, you know, the algorithms, if the algorithms are written by white, you know, algorithm writers or whatever, they skew. And it's as if like, oh, no, this is just this is just value neutral. And so much of science and technology are white, as it were, you know, they, they are I, it's I, um, like the scientific revolution, you, you know, that says who, you know, um, yeah. And so I think we just talked something. about that, those algorithms in our last episode, actually. So that's yeah, a right. nice, uh, that's a nice connection. Yeah, it's in the air, but it's, I think that that's what's so, um, there's something perennial about, about those things and the, the human misadventure. I, one of the things I read was, you know, there's this um, famous uh, speech called the, I think it's called the cornerstone speech that the vice president of the Confederacy gave. Um, I can't remember his name, you know, um, but um, is a spontaneous justification for slavery um and it he his entire argument is based on its scientific fact that the black race is inferior to the white race and you can't you you it's science it's just uh, you know right. you, you can't deny that and that all of the all of the um uh, 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 abolitionists were a bunch of uh, religious fanatics you know, so, so it's, <laughs> it's just well it's astonishing. And as you might expect, after this result from these the visit from these scientists that you read about to us, we get an article in the Foxton Journal, which is the newspaper in the nearest mainland town, whose headline reads, Queer Squatters Deemed Degenerate. And one of the things that I noticed in this in the book was that the word queer appears frequently in reference to the Apple Islanders in a context that's Totally different, but not totally unrelated to the way that we use the word today. And I, I assume that wasn't accidental. And I wondered if you could talk about that, the way you're using that word in the book. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Uh, I mean, the the word itself was prompted by a, um, uh, I, you know, I think maybe like an inset photo of an actual article from one of the news local newspapers. Uh, you know, queer South Sea Islanders. You know, something like you know that's just the strange. You know, and it made me think about you know queerness and queer um, and and you know words, so words like queer, but also words like you know people these people are marginalized, right? And there's the mainland, but it's sort of like you know when I was sitting and thinking of myself as Esther, you know, on the island, uh, you're in my margins, you know. So and you're we're the mainland, you are, you know. So just this idea of otherness and being marginalized and just like who's who's margin, you know, one person's margins or another person's life. And so to be queer, to be queered off of what is norm, you know, the norm. And the more you know, think about it, the more you think, if that's the norm, I don't want to be any part of it, you know, and you start thinking about just what queerness is. Um, and in that case, too, I, I remembered talking with somebody in Provincetown, a friend of mine, um, musician Greg Kendall was doing a bunch of interviews in Provincetown about art and about the community and this sort of thing. And um, 
I just remembered just a, you know I don't even remember the whole context but he said he was talking to an artist and the artist said well you know artists are queers for beauty you know they're queer for beauty so if you're queer for something you know that and then the, kind of the main passage in the book of you know that sort of takes queerness and sort of you know um uh, permutates with it I just I gave to this character Zachary hand to God and um and I just gave him a monologue that I just tried to make like a Whitman poem you know kind of like or you know he's a very poem. powerful character I I like him I mean he's I probably love, one of my favorite yeah I, yeah sure. I mean that's the thing with this these any of these books is you know you just end up loving these people you know like I didn't want to finish the book I'm like I don't want to leave tell me I don't want to leave um but yeah and he's he he ends up he's sort of a you know the book has a lot about prophecy in it too um you know the idea that which is you know I got from teaching the old testament and just gave it to Esther and to but the idea that prophecy a prophet is not somebody who can like magically tell the future a prophet is somebody who looks at the present and sees it clearly and calls it like like he sees it and speaks truth to power, you know, um, and and uh, and can kind of cut through all the ide ideological baloney and all that sort of stuff. So it's not that you can see the future; it's that you can you see where it's at, you know where it's at, and you say where it's at. And if you know where it's at, the future is not difficult to predict, you know. Um, and so, yeah, Zachary, I, you know, it's a, that, that he, this kind of poem or this ode or this lyric about queerness um, is, uh, yeah, I just wanted to give him a, just this very powerful poetic kind of almost sounding like it's, you know, biblical uh, grade poetry um, and just let, turning that word around. To say that it's Whitmanian makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and it's also interesting sort of how continually throughout your answers, there's a lot of connection to ekphrasis and then also to to the other work, like this sort of whole world that you're building. But speaking of the future and seeing the future, the state of Maine, the great state of Maine, issued mm -hmm. an apology about what happened on Malaga Island in 2010 and kind of like failed to tell most of the people who might have cared about it. So I'm curious about whether you talked to descendants of people who lived on Malaga Island um, and maybe what you thought about incorporating because there's a there's a um right the, the epigraph of the novel um has a snippet of the state of Maine conveying its mm -hmm. conveying its when you were writing yeah it's past. interesting because I didn't want to write a, a, an historical novel per se you know I came across that's the story of Malaga Island it laid claim to my imagination uh it laid claim to you know it's, it's America, American history, you know, race in America, all this sort of stuff. So it's just so compelling. But I also knew that I wouldn't be the person to write like a nonfiction book about Malaga. I I wouldn't be there. And, that, and I didn't want to write a novel, a novelized or fictionalized version of the actual people that lived there. So, you know, the sort of the facts that I only read two or three articles about Malaga and then deliberately stopped you know, and so the facts that I sort of sort of um, uh, interlard throughout the book, you could fit them on a three by five index card, you know. So part of it, because part of it was I, I, I there's, you know, there's that kind of border or boundary space between the, the island is a state park, right? the 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 occurrences there are are history they're sort of you know they're america it's it's public domain that sort of thing but then it, and and those sorts of things happened in many places around the country and they happen around the world all the time so there's something kind of just you know all the way back to being you know kicked out of eden that so, so there's something i wanted to take and but but i wanted to do things you know imaginatively with you know, what the island, kind of how the island itself works. You know, I thought of it as being almost like the island in the Tempest from Shakespeare. I thought of it almost like being the Pequod, the ship in Moby Dick. You know, I thought of it as being like Noah's Ark, but they couldn't, but what would it be like if you couldn't get off the Ark, you know? 
so it's it's an Eden, you know, it's paradise as it were. It's aspirational, you know, Eden is sort of somewhat. But it's not perfect. And that's the interesting thing is like a lot of, there are actually a lot of bad things have happened on the island. Right, it's not, yeah. Not, yeah. And, it's not like romanticized, I think, living there. Yeah, in an yeah, no, Eden would be like, that would be the hope of the founders. You know, you're hoping, this, it, 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 you're as, aspiring towards that, but then it ends up being being a little bit, um, a little bit ironic. Um, so, so I, I I deliberately very early just went with the imaginary Apple Island and just worked to to get the um, an imagined version of an event that were in a place much like Malaga Island. But I I I, I you know I sort of the paths diverged. Um, so partly because I just like I just wouldn't be the you know you know sure. the, to write the book that history. I didn't go to the island. I didn't contact, you know, I just didn't do any research on it, you know, just right. because I, again, you know, I, I, you know, one of the things that I know about the descendants is that they are they very private, you know, they don't, you know, sure. you know they, they don't like a lot of publicity. And I didn't, again, I didn't want to, you know, plant a flag or anything like, you know, like I, that would have been, you know, not, not great. Um, and so, um, I kind of, I, and I also, you know, had um, Henry James in mind, you know, who talked about somewhere in one of his um, uh, pre uh, prefaces that he wrote about um, how whenever he, the, the seed or the germ of, a, uh, you know, an idea for a story came from real life, some, you, know, you know, something he heard about at the dinners he always used to attend or whatever, um, he, uh, he said he only ever did just enough research to pique his curiosity, but not to satisfy it, you know? And so that's what I did. And I just, you know, went off and tried to um, just, you know, because the characters, the, you know, the, the characters in, in, in the book are not like the character, you know, not like the, no, the, the, the Islanders. It's because it's pictures. Yeah. And there's something sort of, um, there's a little bit of, I wanted the book to have kind of a, mythic quality to it and kind of a like folklore quality kind of sort of parts of it are kind of almost magical you know so it's it I, I, you know what I wanted to do with the imagination you know with my imagination all that sort of stuff it just wouldn't have worked if I was actually also trying to tell this these people's story on their behalf or whatever that just it just wouldn't have been appropriate sure well, thank you so much for joining us. And we're going to encourage our listeners to go pick up This Other Eden, which is out now. Great. Thanks so much. It's always a blast talking with you. Thanks so much for being here, Paul.